Welcome to Tara and Friends Unedited. I'm glad you've joined us today, and I'm especially happy today to have with me Jane Weaver, who is my very extraordinary friend. <laughs> How's that for an introduction? Scary. <laughs> okay, so I'm so glad you finally came, <laughs> and um, this will be just, um, see, we're just conversing here. But for those at home, I've been talking about Jane Weaver, you know, in different shows. And you have? Yes, mm -hmm. I, I frequently mention Jane Weaver, so I'm so glad you're here. I'm pretty glad to be here. <laughs> you, you'll ease into it. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> so we met initially at, on the farm tour that happens yearly. And you were helping at the Hawk and the Ivy. That's right. And we had a nice long conversation. And then about a year later, maybe, I was... My phone rang. Your phone <laughs> rang. Okay, you tell this part of the story. Um, I'm, I teach music, violin, piano, and cello. And um, the phone rang, and it was uh, another mother looking for a violin teacher for her children. And we started talking about, I don't know, homeschooling and the, uh, the pro what happens when you study music that is actually outside of being able, in addition to being able to play a musical instrument and make music, what, what else happens to a student who is uh, working that hard, putting that much time and energy into the effort? And um, suddenly I realized that you were the person that I had talked to <laughs> a year earlier at the farm tour. And so then we continued. I think that initial phone conversation ended up being several hours. It was very long. Long. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a book list when we got off yeah. the phone. I, I think that was the first mm -hmm. time you introduced me to um, The Mass Psychology of Fascism by Steiner, which I still haven't read all the way through because there's just so much to absorb that I I stopped part it's way. It's not Steiner, but if you hadn't said Steiner, I would be able to. Um, um, you know what, you're Wilhelm right. Wilhelm Reich, there right. we go. Wilhelm <laughs> Reich. And, and then you also introduced me to um, Steiner and anthroposophy and a whole lot of other ideas and people. So generally speaking, every time I talk to you, I come away with about 10 things that I need to look up or follow the threads of conversations of what what is that reference to and try to track things down. Good luck. Yeah, so, so this is my, so, so in my life, I'm just trying to sort of keep up, just, just keep a little um, hold on all these ideas and things that you've already learned. So you're kind of like the, the forerunner there. You've already learned all these things. I'm older than you are. Well. And there was a lot of pressure on me. So. Now, what drives you, though, to be, because um, you are definitely a seeker of knowledge, and um, a, a, you're not really a conformist, I would say, in any mm -hmm. sense of the word. So what caused that? The nonconformity is in my genetic makeup. Um, my mother was dismayed that I was so stubborn, like my father's side of the family. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you add to that a fairly unhappy, rigid childhood and not very good health. So there was always this drive to get it figured out. Why, why was this happening? What could I do about it? Mm -hmm. Do you think that that had something to do with your background in a uh, from a faith system perspective? Um, or Yes, definitely. However, at the time, I had to leave home in order to sort out what was dysfunctional family and what was church. Because you were um, Mennonite? Yes. Okay. And you were the first of your group, if I'm recalling correctly, to leave home or to, to leave home uh, in a way that... A lot that of people had left home, but I actually lived with my boyfriend, which was unacceptable. Scandalous. Scandalous. And so were you welcomed back? Eventually, when I got married and had children, and it looked more um, 
I married a farmer, so you know it was very a more comfortable mm -hmm. sort of uh, lifestyle for my family. And originally, you were from um, Indiana. Yes. So how did you end up here in Asheville? This will take the entire show if you <laughs> want to hear it. That way. Um, there was this guy. Um, how how to tell this? There um, there was a Mennonite college in my hometown, and it um, while it attracted um, lots of conservative Mennonites from farms back in the day, they were mostly from farms. There were few professional Mennonites at that time, profession Mennonites in professions. <laughs> Not that anyone would ever be paid to be a Mennonite, um, <coughs> and. Uh, Goshen College of the several, I think there are about half a dozen Mennonite colleges, I don't know the exact number, but this one in my hometown we heard that um, a lot of the Mennonite bishops out there were advising their young people not to attend it because it was way too worldly and um, it actually is a very good college. It had started a study, study service trimester while I was there, mm -hmm. required everyone to spend a term abroad working wow. and teaching in um, mostly underdeveloped but not always underdeveloped countries. And um, my friends in high school had been professors' kids, and they were fairly worldly because they had been they had spent sabbaticals with their parents in other parts of the world, and they knew that God was not judging people on the basis of how many pleats they had in the prayer coverings they were wearing, or the exact length of their hair, or whether they wore sleeveless dresses mm. or not. What was the question I'm answering? How did you I get to Asheville? It. Oh, okay. So um, we've sorry. gotten to. So the I was, I, yes, I was leaving that behind, and um, I hung out with w what were known as the Young Turks or the Rebels, and um, we did everything we possibly could to um, break the rules and yet stay uh, within limits. So I would stay out after ten o'clock, mm -hmm. or found a cigarette and had it in my room or, um, you know, very daring and dreadful <laughs> acts of deceit like that. And um, my boyfriend started playing in a rock and roll band um, and they were having off-campus concerts and dances and that kind of thing and it was a lot of fun. And they got serious enough that they decided to go to Los Angeles and become rock and roll stars. I joined them out there the life of sex, drugs, and rock and roll was not meant for me. I was a farm mm. kid. I'm coming to Asheville eventually here. Um, and since the guys in the band were Mennonites, they had to keep a student deferment so be during the Vietnam War oh. or do their 1W classification service. And my boyfriend had two brothers already doing this in New York City. So once he got drafted, that's where we went. I had a fairly good job at NYU Medical Center, but I could not stand the city. And I ended up going to an experimental school in Vermont. Ah. And I kept coming back to New Jersey in the summers or working at NYU for the summers. And eventually um, parted from this band that was having trouble making it anyway. Met uh, my husband and married him, and we moved eventually to Clay County, North Carolina. And when you get dressed up and go to town in Clay County, you go to Asheville. Oh, I see. So you. So uh, my daughters studied with a violin teacher here, and we were coming over every week. I began um, teaching a sacred geometry group that was here, and finally, I just couldn't take it anymore, we moved here. I think that tells the story. So Longer you've been you wanted to hear. here <laughs> how many years then? Ten. So Ten in uh, Asheville. In, and then in the whole mm -hmm. in North Carolina area? Since 87. Wow. That's a long time. 
So you mentioned already a number of things, and there's <laughs> so many things I want to get to, because um, everything that you do is just so interesting, and <sighs> it really is. I uh, see you. You think this is not interesting because it's your own life, but it really is. Have you had a program where you tell about your life? No, no, no. Okay. We don't really go there. We could we do that. Just, uh, I mean, I think. It, in almost every program, it sort of comes up that I'm making a shift out of a very conservative kind of paradigm because that's where I tend to connect with people more, mm -hmm. but um, not too much detail. <laughs> so we're here to focus on you. So okay, but we'll, we'll make up for that lack. Yeah, we can do that another day. Okay. So how long have you been teaching violin? <clears throat> Um, I guess I, I was a Suzuki parent, my, and my oldest da older daughter, who is now 26, began when she was three. So somehow that's when my involvement began, although I'd, I'd had violin lessons, sort of, in the public school system as a kid. Did you major in music? No. Okay. Oh, heavens, no. <laughs> you didn't? Okay, what was your, what did you study at school? Um, I was a math major for a while, but I was too tense and suicidal to continue. And I, as I did all this traveling math across... Math will do that to you, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> I was okay. the only one. Everybody else seemed fine. <laughs> but in was making it, What this, made you suicidal? Oh, feeling like I couldn't that I was stupid and that it was really important that nobody find out and overachieving oh. and mm -hmm. not having any emotional support and okay and that's a whole yes that's a <laughs> that's a series of shows mm -hmm. but a very important topic it is that's true so you were overwhelmed as a in a, in this math major right and um, at that point is when I left town with my rock and roll boyfriend to go to Los Angeles and then when I came back I went to school in Vermont um, over the telephone they accepted me and I should have known better but it was an experimental school <laughs> where you didn't really have to do anything and um, my major professor there two of them were generalists who had hundreds and hundreds of graduate level credits and wow. several degrees among them and the main professor there had no had I think three master's degrees and this extra several hundred credits that he'd never accumulated in one area long enough to get more advanced degrees and as we were dropouts all of us were dropouts from the regular academic mm -hmm. system and happy to yeah, to me that sounds like a dream come true to have all those credits mm -hmm. and be <laughs> learning but I think you are a generalist yeah in mm -hmm in all these areas, but you are more specific. You know a lot about the fields. When you study something, you really dig into it in a way that I don't. So I'll admit that sometimes I do use you as a shortcut for. Okay, well that you know. must be what I'm here for. Then. Yes, mm -hmm. this is a. On the, I don't mean here, but on the planet. On the planet, mm -hmm. yes. You're the go-to information I'm willing person. to do the homework. You, mm -hmm. Yeah, you put the time in on that. And I'm just trying to figure it all out. Like, what is that? What does that mean? Who was this person? And why does this go in, in the place? But when we mm -hmm. first met, I think we were talking about religions, and you had undertaken a whole study of esoteric religions. And I had to go home and look up the word esoteric. And <laughs> it means um, hidden. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I don't know if you want to talk about that, if that interests you today, but <coughs> I'm not sure where you want to go with it, but what I would say is if you are um, a Buddhist, for example, let me take a step backwards. In general, for most of what I know of the world religions, there is a prepackaged version that is given to the masses. And usually it's um, a set of rules for behavior, perhaps for dress, for eating, um, getting along in your community, and so forth. And then there will be an elite group 
that knows more than that, that knows um, information about spiritual development, how to raise your consciousness, perhaps in the case of Tibetan Buddhism, how to levitate stones or mm. um, how to leave this world when the time comes in a meditative state, um, all that kind of thing. People who are busy growing their own food and raising their families do not have the kind of time and effort to put into um, esoteric studies like that. But in some cases, it also becomes kind of disrespectful of the rank mm -hmm. and file. You know, Well, you may get a question from somebody if you are a, a religious authority and you decide, well, that's too deep for them or they don't deserve to know it or they're not going to use it anyway or I would be casting my pearls before swine or whatever. Um, so there is often a great deal of disinformation or useless information, I think, my opinion, um, given out to people. My family was very involved in, uh, up until, let's say, World War II, not driving cars, not having short skirts or pretty mm -hmm. clothing, or uh, and glorying in how humble they were to match this little set of rules that made their lives much easier to live. They didn't have to make any decisions. So um, in Buddhism, you can go to a Mahayana Buddhist or a Tibetan Buddhist, perhaps, and begin the study of esoteric, uh, of an esoteric nature. If you are Islamic or Muslim, you have the Sufis you can go off and study with. They have the knowledge. Although we're learning from Peter Kingsley, who lives in town now, that uh, the origin of the Sufi um, knowledge was uh, Empedocles and Parmenides, who were Greeks, pre-Socratic Greek avatars, he thinks, if I'm quoting him properly. Um, if you are a Christian, if you are a Catholic, you might go to a Jesuit university or um, take vows and become a monk or something like that in search of higher religious experience and spiritual development. But for most of the Protestant branches, there isn't any. So uh, what does that mean, <clears throat> that there that there isn't any? Um, I guess they don't get it. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, because I don't want to say raises, anything too damning. But it, gonna... it raises several questions for me. Like, is there no deeper well, surface to be found? Or, as I understand it, uh, there are some who say that the Western tradition, which would have come out of Egypt and out of the Hebrew religion and passed up the globe into Europe is held by the Rosicrucians. Um, and this, there is an American branch of the Rosicrucians, AMORC, which is generally not included in this um, statement about Rosicrucians. As I, to my understanding, the Rosicrucians, who are lineage holders of the information, basically do not publish books about themselves or about the mm -hmm. teachings. They do not have huge cathedrals or auditoriums filled with TV cameras and choirs and stuff like that. They're hidden away doing their thing and mm. working on themselves and whatever they see as their role or their, li their purpose for this lifetime. And they will be found, they understand they will be found by the true seekers. Mm. in some way. And that word Rosicrucian was new to me and recently I came across that and a whole nother puzzling thing. Say I keep a list of things that I need <laughs> to ask Jane whenever I see you. Um, but there was an email that came from the Vesica Institute mm -hmm. that's here in town mm -hmm. that I believe you are on their website. I believe or I in some am. capacity. Mm -hmm. But um, they were outlining some series for this winter solstice um, time the period. The Twelve Holy Nights? Is that there were a number mm -hmm. of, of events and programs, and I, it just, again, just completely boggled me because I never knew that this existed. 
I knew that there was Christmas, I knew that there was winter solstice, I knew that there were, but this sounded like a whole nother um, set of events and interpretations for the season. Mm -hmm. And there were references made to, I think, astrological timing and positioning of things as well as Steiner's, uh, so, I'll have to bring you the paper. Okay. It was <laughs> it was all new to me, mm -hmm. but they mentioned Rosicrucian mm -hmm. in this. I think there's been a workshop given there, which will be given again in January, um, <coughs> which would be, uh, well, Robert Gilbert is, um, I don't know if he would appreciate my saying this or not, but uh, one of his vast understandings is is the Rosicrucian body of knowledge, mainly through Rudolf Steiner, who is the le the most recent Rosicrucian. Rosicrucian information is, um, how would you say, it's kind of mandated that it appear and then it disappear for a while, mm -hmm. and then it comes back again and then disappears for a while. So Rudolf Steiner died, I believe, in 1925 and left behind a lot of literature. Um, he's not the only Rosicrucian there ever was, but he's one of the main ones. And Robert is doing his best to um, help people who are interested in understanding that Steiner's viewpoint, why we're here, what we're doing. And this workshop was, I believe, in um, using whatever information we can to understand our karmic reason for this in particular incarnation. So it's very fascinating and very interesting. So I have to talk to the camera for a second. See, it's stuff like this that just <laughs> <laughs> makes me, you know, I just, I'm not kidding that every time I get to talk to Jane, I come away feeling a little bewildered, but also completely <laughs> excited about all kinds of ideas and possibilities that I did not know previously. And also... This is a little break here, a little. Okay. We, oh, we hop we all over. Are now, we off the record here, No, th this is a, <laughs> it's a conversation show. Mm -hmm. So it just okay. kind of, it, it goes the way my normal conversations do. Bing, 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 yes. Bing. Oh, yes. So last, was it two Christmases ago that um, we ended up coming over to your house for sort of a dessert and conversation and you and your daughters played a, um, concert what was that called i believe we played the corelli christmas concerto or concerto grosso and opus six number eight i think yes and it was mm -hmm. just this beautiful thing of what else could be more perfect than to have had this sort of impromptu professional level concert by three <laughs> musicians and um and have this warm, cozy house. And your house also feels like it's designed with um, sacred geometry principles, which I think you did make alterations to your house in some ways. Yes, it was renovated. <laughs> and so it was just this amazing experience that, see, I don't, I don't forget any of these. I don't take these things for granted, Jane. OK, I want to say one more thing about the Christmas season then, since yes. it is upon us. Um, is a Rosicrucian understanding, though not limited to Rosicrucians, I think um, Chinese philosophy would also um, understand the nature of wintertime when the planet is essentially turned away from the sun a little bit more than usual as a time of accepting and receiving spiritual influences from the cosmos. Whereas in summer, everything is growing and blasting outward and using itself up mm -hmm. in time for autumn. And then again, the forces, when we turn away from the sun, we can accept these forces and get ready for the next cycle as we play the circle game here. Right. So the most um, accessible nights are the 12 nights of Christmas. It's not... Um, just by chance that so many uh, deeply heroic religious figures were born on December 25th. Mm. It's three days after the um, winter solstice, 
a time when uh, the sun appears to stand, stand still. Say that again. The <laughs> sun appears to stand still. The night is the shortest night of the year. Um, could be a time of fear if you didn't have all the weather predictions and the studies of astronomy that we have now. But then, from that point on, the world begins to revive itself. There is a tradition that initiation requires three and a third days. This was the amount of time Christ spent in the tomb. It was supposedly the amount of time that an initiate spent in the king's chamber, so-called king's chamber of the Great Pyramid, while a hierophant helped him leave his body safely and experience the universe and come back. Um, and this, this number of three and a third is also carried out in Christ's age, which he was 33 at the time that this mm. happened and had three years of ministry and whatnot. So starting three and a third days after the solstice are 12 days when the spiritual forces are at their strongest. Mm. And lots of people, and in many traditions, they understand this and they take advantage of that time to do a lot of extra meditation or not work so hard or feast or whatever. Interesting. So when you um, have discovered this, when you were doing your when you were doing your research into the different religions to find what was what what impact did that study have on you personally? Where did it lead you in your spiritual journey? Do you claim a specific spiritual path um, now or <laughs> Um, I guess I could say I'm a Rosicrucian because you can be anything and be a Rosicrucian. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's nice. The idea of a rose is very nice, mm -hmm. very beautiful. And um, one of the emblems for Rosicrucians is the uh, Christic cross with seven roses around it. And I believe one in the middle. It's very pretty. Um, no, I, I did uh, the Pashna meditation and had instruction in... Buddha, Tibetan Buddhism for 15 years or so and then I moved to another place and kind of left that behind and ran into some other people that were doing something interesting. I don't think I personally have the focus and attention span to stick with one thing like maybe I should. I don't know. I don't know. You, but you find the most interesting people and things to study True. and to be yes. part of. So these are just some of the things that I know about you that you are, I would say, are an expert in all of these things, but you can say that you Don't are. Don't say that on the air. Okay, yeah. we'll say that you um, enjoy and have studied or participate in these things. Sacred geometry which I still don't even know enough about. See, I want you to just start teaching workshops on all of these things so that I can just become <laughs> an apprentice, a Jane Weaver apprentice. You could do that. Um, I could. We would need to find, dig up the people. Well, they will Unless come. You want private, if you will teach it, they will come. You can have private tutorials as well. So <laughs> there's this sacred geometry part of the equation, and then Jinshin Jitsu, and these are all things that we need to talk about. Alchemy, um, gardening, but not just ordinary planting of flowers. You're, you do these philosophical things or tie things in bio, what was that oh. stuff that I found at your house? That Biodynamic thing? preparations. Biodynamic preparations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, there's all sorts of things that you do with the gardening that's not just ordinary. Nothing is ordinary with you, Jane. <laughs> Quilt making, but not just ordinary quilt making, mandala quilt making, which were beautiful, by the way, at the show. Yeah, thank you. I see them in my head. They're lovely. I have a website. You can go there, too, and get them backlit. So yes. <laughs> green. Yeah, that could also <laughs> save my pennies by a picture yeah. of one. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then things happen where I'll just be talking with you about some of the areas that I already know that you participate in or are in, engaged in and then you just sort of drop a comment about some French translations that you've been doing. I still don't even really know what that was. You've translated works from English?
English? Uh, the French? No, no, couldn't do that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> between the world wars, um, radiesthesia, which we would know as dowsing, but the word itself means uh, aesthesia is an ability to sense, and radia would be short for radiation, so an ability to sense vibrations, emanations, that kind of thing. Um, in France, which has a very um, long tradition of high intellectual activity and mm. um, desire to understand the world, uh, radiesthesia became very popular. It is the use of the human body as an antenna to detect radiations. So uh, people have heard about uh, using dowsing to find underground sources of water or mineral deposits or lost items or should I take this vitamin or that vitamin and use oh, like kinesiology pendulum. kind of um, muscle response testing that's related but ish wouldn't I don't know that the kinesiologists would appreciate being, being tied put, in with yeah but it's mm -hmm. based on the principle that everything has energy and vibrates yes. at a frequency. And that we, when we conjoin our field with the field of, of that for which we are searching, we're trying to understand that we will get information do physically. You, do you believe all knowledge is knowable? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I guess not. I don't know. Like I was curious. All knowledge. I mean, as, as like, does a tree I mean, in the can we know everything? Probably not. I, I can, think I, are there ways that we can find out answers in this experience, in this human experience, to all of our questions? Or are there some things we just have to wait? And s we have sort of three-dimensional, limited imaginations. But I don't know that's if there's a, something that was we can't. a totally can't, random yeah, thought. Yeah. So I, don't have I keep idea. forgetting we're not really <laughs> talking mm -hmm. off of camera. OK. So back to, so sorry to interrupt our flow there. So you were, um, so you were talking about the, um, what were we just talking dousing. about? The dowsing, the translations. Okay, so um, <clears throat> Robert Gilbert, the aforementioned, and I studied with uh, Dr. Ibrahim Karim of Cairo, who is a radiesthesiast slash architect slash I believe he was Minister of Health briefly um, in Egypt uh, but he is an uh, he has developed the science of radiesthesia particularly for um, health purposes improving health and improving um, environments shall we say um, website would be biogeometry.com and .org. There are two. One is his own, one is a Dutch site. Um, and Robert Gilbert at Vesica is his uh, United States English-speaking representative mm -hmm. and um, is a place where you can purchase the geom geometric items that will do these, em make these emanations and clear out your space. That's really a are brief these demonstration, related brief explanation. Are those objects related to the sacred geometry forms that you've created that are in your home? Um, yes and no. That would be it would be hard to describe that. He's made all his own and and f based on his work. I and think I should do a documentary on you <laughs> and do like because every time I go to your house, I feel like I should pay admission because it's a. Oh no. <laughs> no, this is totally true. But don't you think that would be good? Then, then we could get into these topics and a little bit more. you could go around with your cameras and, and see this and this. Oh, and this I got in, like well, Jackie could Kennedy. You, know, <laughs> you could say how you made yes, the story behind this the items. Room we <laughs> so I'm going to finish this thing about the French stuff. So this Kareem went to specifically to Paris to learn this particular kind of dowsing. And there were five... Uh, Radiesthesias in particular who published probably what was the best work. I mean there are thousands of books and there was a convention in 1954 that had 10,000 people attending. Wow. It dropped off almost immediately after that I think due to the war and and um, quote progress that was made in academic 
in the uh -huh. academic worlds. What radiesthesia is the non-physical counterpoint in my mind to um, particle research that's being that has been legitimized by the academic institutions. We're going to find a particle that is responsible for gravity now, you know, mm -hmm. and and everything is all about breaking up particles and seeing what what kind of fragments they make and and how does that fit? And they're trying to figure out what's going on. But this other batch who is deemed to be crazy or less scientific, which they were not, um, was were thinking, no, you know what? The basis of our physical life here is actually energy. And we mm -hmm. can show you. We make ourselves into an antenna. We connect with thought or eyesight or however we do it. And the body will give responses that are indicative of what's going on. So there were these five great writers, and their work was never translated mm -hmm. into English. And one day I took a wild hair and thought with my three and a half years of high school French, I might be able to translate it and... Because you had nothing else to do. Right. <laughs> well, there were, you know, there are 30 mm -hmm. or 40 people out there who would be interested in reading this <laughs> in English. So um, that's what I did. So you translated... There are about a dozen books that are, yeah. Wow. So you have to add that to the list. Translator. Musician, JSJ. But it isn't the kind of translation that would that would stand next to somebody who really does translation. You know? And yet, you just up and did some translations. Yes. Okay, so there's that <laughs> on, the, on the list. Now, okay, we have to hurry because there's so much to talk about still. So, all right, let's start at the top of the list. So violin, when you teach mm -hmm. violin, I've noticed since we've been taking, mm -hmm. the kids have been taking lessons from you we for should a have, number of years. We should have several of them here. Well, we'll do a show sometime <laughs> okay. on the violin. Okay. Maybe we can do that. And the importance of music outside of, you know, in ways that people may not consider. Because mm -hmm. that has to do with vibrations too, right? You're right. It does. So maybe we could approach it from that perspective. Um, I could think of a, but your approach to the violin I have to say this part. It's not just about the musical instrument. The first lesson, when we first came to you and took the first lesson, that you also are approaching the playing of the instrument from a physical alignment perspective of, I think initially you were correcting posture and poses. So that, maybe if you want to talk a little bit about why you come at the instrument um, from oh, that okay. approach, this is, yeah, this it ties is not, in with the JSJ. This is definitely not spiritual. This is physical real, real out, realism, reality. Okay. Um, one of your daughters was holding her violin in such a way that her neck was crooked, her back was arched, putting a lot of pressure on about TV 12 back there. And um, the violin was so big for her that she was having to cantilever the weight of it with her mm -hmm. chin this way. She was in pain. And she had, had been no taking for about three years before we came to you. Mm -hmm. But I don't think she had that big violin all that time. No, she yeah. just had that. Yeah. It was so too. this was, so when we first connected with you and learned this, you, it was really, I believe, pretty life-changing, pretty important. I hope so. We didn't even know she was in pain. Mm -hmm. She didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. So we went back to the smaller size, which was, um, there's a, there are certain, what would you call them, kinesiological relationships of, mm -hmm. where the arm, when you see a person playing a violin, it looks like it's sticking out to their side, but it's not. Their arm's actually in front. Try this. Try moving your hands up and down at your sides. Feel what that does to your mm -hmm. back, and then do it in front of your body. Oh, that's much easier. Much easier. So you put the violin here. It still kind of looks like it's sticking out to the side, but it isn't really. Mm -hmm. And you want to have it, have your shoulder supporting the weight of it so that you don't have to use your chin to mm -hmm. hold it there to keep it from slipping. Um, it's very basic. I, it's not. It doesn't. I'm not a hero. But not for every knowing music this. teacher uh, cares about the physical body so really? much. 
Well, I would say not, <laughs> okay. since we had never heard of anything <laughs> like that before. So what brings you to that practical connection and concern for the physical body? Well, it's easy. I mean, if you're in pain, you don't practice. You won't. You won't, you won't pick up your, you won't glad, I mean, it's hard enough to get yourself if you're a child or anyone mm -hmm. to practice and if it's killing you with pain you're not going to do it mm -hmm. and you, you won't be able to play well I mean it's not there's no so you had an ulterior motive you're saying you wanted her to enjoy the process <laughs> yes <laughs> I was going to say you want her to practice more so get yourself yeah, together here. yeah so this um, I was going to try to lead that into um, your discovery of Jin Chin Jitsu and how you are you a practitioner. You might want to lead it into my, instead, into who my fourth grade violin teacher was. Tell us about your fourth grade violin teacher. Bernard Jen. F. Schnellbach. Schnellbach. I, if anybody knows him, I, I imagine he is no longer living because he was probably 30 years older than I was. Um, he was the band teacher in our town. My, there was no, um, string program whatsoever and my mother and one other girl's mother in town wanted them to us to play violins I think, and we were Mennonites so I think it was to keep us out of the marching band <laughs> <laughs> and so as a fourth grader my mother had a violin it was this big on my oh. body and then this great giant long bow Jane and the giant bow and Bernard F. Schnellbach who was the high school band leader came to our school and gave me violin lessons which basically consisted of him checking a mark on the page and saying do this for next week and turning the page and the rest of the time sitting there either with his face scrunched <laughs> up in his hand over his forehead and then chewing his nails way down below it any nails oh. I have ever seen in Oof. my life. So again, you know, having a rotten childhood is actually a great advantage. It, it makes you want to understand a better way. It provides a lot of contrast. Yes, it does, for indeed. Mm -hmm. Very contrasting to what I thought I really wanted. Mm -hmm. And so then you took steps to get to what you really Eventually, when, once I got out of there, yes. I mean, it took a while to achieve escape velocity. <laughs> <laughs> escape velocity. So how did you get involved with or learn about the Jin Shin Jitsu? Um, Jitsu? This, is a, this actually is a conversation about Robert Gilbert. Some, I was, as a geometer, I was interested in the formation of the human body. Why is it five-fold? Why are there five projections from the trunk? Why are these lengths all related in the golden mean? Why, why is the inside not symmetrical like the outside is symmetrical? Why, why don't we have three arms and one leg? Or, you know, what, how, how is this settled? And um, <clears throat> somebody said to Robert that I should study ki iki jutsu um, if I was interested in understanding because this would be the study of flows, energetic flows that actually are responsible for the formation of the body itself. Some of them are very symmetrical, some of them are not, some are mm -hmm. very laminar. Um, and so I did that and eventually found out that the, um, the the lineage of the teaching originated with the, a crew called that called the practices Jin Shin Jutsu. Jin meaning um, the harmonized man. Shin is in many languages means breath, um, inspiration of the creator, and whatnot. And Jutsu is the art of so mm. sort of the art of creating. A human, Interesting. in a way. Hmm, I thought it was the art of breathing. I mean, the well, art of that's actually how we stay oh. in our bodies. If if you stop that's breathing, you'll find out pretty quickly. That you all <laughs> about the breath. Yes, <laughs> and that connection. Yeah, mm -hmm. lately I've been thinking, that's really what we're here to do—to breathe. Like we mm -hmm. can breathe well, or we can. Mm -hmm. breathe not well. I mean, you can really simplify everything that we are really simple, that that breath is it. That I'm still kind of mm -hmm. trying to figure, mm -hmm. to wrap my brain around that one. Mm -hmm. 
um, in general, try to breathe evenly and longly and deeply and uh, harmoniously. And, and so the study of Jin Shin Jitsu allows <coughs> you to do certain flows which um, allow you to, mm, it's, it's so, <laughs> I took the workshop, I love it, I need to take it again because it was so much to absorb. I think what you're trying to say is that every human being has special circuitry that enable them to use their hands uh, in a healing fashion, either on themselves. Jin Jin Jitsu is unique in that it is um, a self-help situation, although it is actually more powerful if you conjoin mm -hmm. your energy system with another person and treat another person. Um, the point is that or the, the explanation for why and how it works is given that um, there is a descending circuit of energy from our source that particularizes and individualizes itself, flows away from source so that source gets a chance to experience something. Mm. It individualizes itself into a human being and circulates the human being and then finishes the circuit by going back to source. And this is where we get our energy. It really does not um, contradict any spiritual teaching that I know of. It's very it's so simple and probably true. The language probably scarce. Oh yeah. Some. Yeah. Yeah. But but in at the basic level, I mean, scientifically, it is has been proven that we um, exist energetically and vibrationally mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. everything has energy and I think all yeah. that's been proven now. I don't know that this circuitry sort of thing can mm. be proven mm -hmm. but again try not breathing for a while and either you will <laughs> something will make you breathe or that will be your last breath but anyway um, so then some of the vicissitudes of earthly life like not breathing correctly or living a lifestyle that is not conducive to good health or having an accident or living in a polluted toxic environment can plug up these flows and there are safety valves kind of along the flows that absorb that that collect the plugging up stuff there and this takes you further and further away then if, if you're blocking this circuitry if it can no longer make the return trip like an electric light circuit then that's a problem. Then, then you'll you'll experience symptoms and eventually not experience your symptoms. <laughs> right. Well, in some ways, it seems so simple because, like you said, the tools for Jin Shin Jitsu are the hands, and so even while even while we're sitting here, and you probably are doing a little flow based on the fingers, are, I doesn't hold each my fingers. each mm -hmm. finger represents corresponds with certain physical. Um, parts of the body as well as emotional mm -hmm. um, but I say I'm a bad <laughs> student I don't remember them all but I know that one was fear and one was anxiety and trying too hard this one's trying too hard mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so you could just hold the finger you know and and, over, and over time yeah holding the finger and over time you'll become more aware of that you're trying too hard the stresses you may um, come more to grips with them. It's hard to say the symptoms that are related to your trying too hard may lessen, may disappear. Mm -hmm. Well, and some interesting things have happened. Um, I've had up two, maybe two treatments um, on your table and they were, I was in a bad way. I remember mm -hmm. when I had that migraine, I couldn't even open my eyes. I looked like death warmed over and um, I had that treatment and it cleared. I could actually, in the course of that 40 minutes, feel early things on, yeah. clear and mm -hmm. release. And then eventually sort of the energy returned. It was very interesting to mm -hmm. sort of um, to Tell about that. your toe. <laughs> oh, should I tell about my toe? <laughs> oh, all right, we'll have to do a whole other show on, on this toe. topic too, mm -hmm. on Jin Shin Jitsu. <laughs> but yeah, I had this toe and I thought it just was genetic because my mom has this so mm -hmm. We have a couple toes that just, it's, it's kind of gross. It's like a little slug. It just curves, you know. Well, the thing about it is right that over. all your 
toenails with, were blue, very beautifully blue, but then this one was... Painted blue? Weren't they? Yes, that's oh, my memory of okay, that Okay, purple. Maybe they were blue. I rarely paint my toenails, so I forget. Well, this, it was I think we had a family toenail painting okay. party, so <laughs> it's coming back to me now. So I had the, the designer toenails going on. Mm -hmm. And on both feet, one of them was missing, but the toenail uh -huh. was actually hitting the ground, or your shoe. Mm -hmm. It was buckled over. Mm -hmm. And so after you did the flow, and that is kind of interesting because how you know which flow to give, you listen to the pulse, so you're actually mm -hmm. feeling for the, the pulse is speaking to you somehow. I haven't figured out that, as you know. I, <laughs> I believe it, but I just haven't, haven't experienced that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then whatever flow it was that we were supposed to do, at the end of that time, we were so amazed because my toe had uncurled and has pretty much remained uncurled, although I think I'm due for another mm. treatment starting <laughs> to edge back over. So what does sickness um, mean in our... You're out of touch with source. Somehow something's blocked. If you can just get it opened up again, these energies that will do what they're supposed to do. So it's physically. possible to live well and reconnect in a pretty um, simple fashion if we just know the right way to... I don't know how simple, but yeah, that's the goal. I had, being a sick kid, I had studied homeopathy, which mm. I don't have the memory banks for. I just love but it's what wonderful. I've learned about homeopathy. Yeah. Um, flower essences, and I was studying medical qigong when this um, information about jinshin jutsu came to me. And medical qigong is great. I'm the, the qigong hospitals in China basically get all the incurable patients and they have some huge like 99 wow. percent success rate but you show up at the qigong hospital and you are either doing qigong or having qigong done to you 24 7 or i thought I, I'm that sure was an exercise form it, do i have it the is, wrong thing but it is uh, designed to refill your depleted energy systems and the oh. kinds of motions you use are probably doing the same kind of thing that when I touch you okay. do. I'm how, not sure about that. But how is um, Jin Shin Jitsu related to um, Reiki or acupuncture or different forms that also use energy? Obviously it's mm -hmm. much closer to those and it's believed to be the foundation for all both the Eastern and the Western um, divisions of medicine, even Paracelsus and Pythagoras and Herodotus. Um, Hippocrates is who I can think of. Um, that it, that it, the thought is that this is the basis. And again, like we were talking about the Rosicrucian information, mm -hmm. because it has had been a folk art, it, it seems to submerge itself every now and then and then come up again. And um, then gets absorbed and taken into various individualized um, forms. Uh, if you do, I'm going to make up a Taoist name, White Mountain Tai Chi. It's because the guy who <laughs> cured himself of something or other with some version of this knowledge, um, word got around and people came to study with him and he gave them his version of what he knew. You know, this is always oral tradition until this century. Interesting. So, um, Why do you think that changed in this century? because we can print it out in books. It, there was an attempt made to keep it oral, but it, it just couldn't be done. It's too much information. And although it's really, really simple, there's a lot of information. It's very simple to apply, I mm -hmm. guess. But as you said, it's um, learning to understand the pulses, which takes a lifetime, essentially. But there are certain factors about the pulses that anybody can learn to feel in a few weeks and um, ask me something else. Okay. My train <laughs> well, when I was um, taking the Jin Shin Jitsu uh, workshop that you offered, and I guess this was probably over a year ago, um, you had also recently come up with a theory that had to do with, and we can talk about it next time if you want, <laughs> but it was just, it, it just showed that you're 
putting together all these different systems of thought and synthesizing those was something about the rotation of the planets and the way that um, the energy is condensed. Does this make uh, sense? Um, Remember you drew the yes, diagram? Yes. Uh, yeah, this is uh, from it's an fascinating. alchemist. What's the guy's name? I can't think of his name. French alchemist who is still alive now. He's in his 90s. Oh. It, anyway, in his, um, his book, he um, showed how at various times of the year, certain, because of the position of the planet um, around the sun, and since we have elliptical orbits, they are not circular, they are actually two foci. The sun, the real sun, sits at one of the foci, and the other focus at one focus, and the other one is called the invisible sun and then ellipses are related spatially to those two centers, whereas a circle just has mm -hmm. one center. And um, given the time of the year when the um, Earth is rotating around the real sun and the invisible sun, when it gets over here, the real sun is blocking energies that are streaming out of Saturn and various other planets. I think that's what you're talking about. And it was it made so much sense to me. It was I was very excited, and I got someone to help me make a diagram of it and, and a model. And it was very neat. Uh, that reminds me too the, um, of the time that your friend William made the. You were putting together the puzzle of the Sistine Chapel mm -hmm. that was enormous, <laughs> three thousand pieces. <laughs> and then and then we came over, and I think there was a several hour long um, talk. Mm -hmm. That um, and he was an art professor, I think, mm -hmm. and so he was sharing about that. That was fascinating too, all these things. But that was another side <laughs> thing. So we just have a few minutes left, and so I think that we should do a show on each of these topics in the future. Sure. So that we can be more. You're mm -hmm. just saying that because the cameras are rolling. Aren't you? <laughs> was this too bad? It wasn't too bad. It's was not it? too bad. So we can converse like this and I I'll try seen to the rushes yet though you know so I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well this has been so exciting for me because I've been wanting to get you here so that I can share you with everybody out there and I just um, continue to be so grateful that our paths crossed Likewise. twice mm -hmm. and that um, you know I, I just feel like I don't have the time right now, well, mainly for obvious three little reasons, to delve into things to the depth that I would like to, but it just makes me feel better knowing that somebody out there <laughs> has done There's that or has that information there, yeah. or, mm -hmm. um, you know, I can call up and say, what, is, what does this mean? How does this work? So I found this quotation today in the Heart Steps um, book by Julia Cameron that I thought applied specifically to you and your approach to life because even though you had do a lot in this intellectual spiritual world you also are very practical and grounded and I appreciate that I'm trying to figure all that out so this is the quotation it is life that must be our practice it is not enough to hear spiritual truth or even to have our own spiritual insights every aspect of what happens to us must become part of a learning experience Diane Marie Child. So that makes me think about you and your learning experiences, which then become learning experiences for others. Good. Okay. It's, it's, it's all just trying to figure out life's little instruction book. You know, they didn't give us one. So, and I think mine will probably be a different flavor than anybody else's once you get yours going, maybe. Wait, <laughs> we're out of time? Okay, wait, but there was this thing about, I lead my life in partnership with the universe. In all situations, I have choices and options which lead me to freedom and expansion. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Freedom mm -hmm. and expansion. Rudolf Steiner, it's... <laughs> <laughs> she cut us off. Oh, keep talking, Before it's she, Well, Rudolf Steiner said we are, our true name as a species is the spirits of freedom, of love and freedom. Oh, other other levels of the spiritual hierarchy do not have freedom. We 
get to choose right or wrong, left or right, up or down, free and.